Okay, wonderful. Um, let, let me introduce to you a, a, a beloved brother, Dr. Nick Hallin, a, 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 a medical doctor, a GP, and all sorts of things, but uh, a pastor, a, a lead pastor in the city and across the nation. One that's been a, a friend and a co-partner uh, in serving the Lord in this city for many years. I was um, seeking the Lord concerning today. Uh, I've, been on, I've been under pressure for quite a few months now, doing various things. And so, and I asked the Lord, I said, I, 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 I need his heart for discipleship. And he shares this, this message across the nation. And so I felt it was important for us to get an input into the importance of disciple, making disciples, discipling as part of our whole strategy for developing leaders. So, go away from me. Thank you, thank you, Tanya. And uh, it's lovely to be here. Uh, Tanya and I share a great deal in common, uh, both born in Nigeria, uh, both, are, both are the same age, both planted churches at the same time, That's right. <laughs> and uh, just lots and lots of stuff. We, I consider him my, my closest brother in ministry in Liverpool, That's right. and uh, love him dearly, and thank huge you. respect for Pastor Tanny. So yeah. thank you for allowing me to be here today. Now, we have a relatively short time, so I'm going to just throw a few ideas out. And uh, hopefully you can pick up on those things which are useful. But let me, let me first of all ask you, um, I want you to talk to each other for 30 seconds and ask one another the question, why do we want to raise leaders? What's the big deal? Why raise leaders? You've got 30 seconds and I want you to shout out your top answer, okay, the number one answer at the end of 30 seconds. <laughs> Okay, 30 seconds is up. So let's have your top answer from that table at the corner. A bit louder. Part of the Great Commission. Love that answer. Yep, this table over here. At the back. Save souls. I love that one. That, that one too. It's fantastic. This middle table. We said that as well. And then. So I was just discussing a transformational leadership. So having a team of people that want to actually buy into your dream and carry that vision forward rather than buy into your vision simply for payments and rewards. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. This table here. To carry on. To carry on. Good answer. Okay, this table. And we say for growth and expansion of the vision. For growth and expansion of the ministry. Okay, so I'm, as a person, uh, I did used to be a GP, but I haven't practiced medicine for 25 years, so please, no medical questions today. <laughs> so, you may get a rubbish answer. Um, my passion is around raising disciples who make disciples. And, uh, you know, when Jesus said to his disciples, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey, obey all that I've commanded you to do. What did he just commanded them to do? <laughs> to go and make disciples. Yeah. So when you cannot be a disciple without being a disciple maker. So you say amen to that? Amen. And a disciple maker, by definition, is a leader because they are having influence on another person or people or group of people or generation or organization. A disciple maker is someone who is influencing others. Maxwell's definition of leadership is influence. Mothers and fathers are leaders. They are influencing their children. You know, a department leader in an office is a leader because they are influencing people they're working with. Anyone Anytime you are influencing someone, you are exercising leadership. But the heart of this process, from Jesus' perspective, 
is being a disciple who makes disciples. Now, I think about the ways of Jesus a lot. We often talk about the words of Jesus, the works of Jesus. With Pentecostal charismatic, we talk about the wonders of Jesus. But what about the ways of Jesus? How did Jesus actually do things? It's often not, you don't think about that a great deal. So we're going to refocus a little bit on that today as we think about some very simple tools. I love the idea of having tools that we can pass on to others. Um, because, and, but I, I'm, I'm a simple person basically, and I like things that are simple. Easy to remember, easy to use, easy to pass on. Simple, sticky, and reproducible tools. The reason I started with the why leadership question is because the why question is always the most important question. If we haven't got a reason for doing something, we aren't going to do it, are we? We're not going to make disciples, we're not going to raise up other disciples, we're not going to raise leaders unless we know why. Now, we probably have different reasons for that as came out across the room. My reason, I want to see Jesus come back. Do you want to see Jesus come back? You know, we've got a job to do. There is a task. We've heard about task, team, and individual. There's a task to be completed, which is that this gospel will be preached in all nations, in all people groups, as a testimony to all nations, and then the end shall come. The only way we're going to get the job done is by raising leaders. And the starting point for that is to go and make disciples. So, we think about making disciples as the starting point for raising leaders. Just to give you some context, um, the organization I work with is called Kairos Connection. It's a national network of leaders and churches who are all focused on this priority of raising missionary disciples. Raising missionary disciples. It's about raising, making disciples who make disciples. It's about multiplying disciples, multiplying leaders, multiplying communities of believers to reach every man, woman, and child with the gospel. The book that I uh, completed last year uh, is the book that goes alongside many of the things I'm going to share with you today. I did bring a couple of copies with me, not because I'm trying to sell a load, but because if there's a couple of you that want one, you can get them for a tenner today, the $12.95, $12.99 online. Uh, but you can also take that little flyer that reminds you about it if you want to come back to it at a later date. But the tools I'm going to share with you today are in the book, as along with many, many others. So my story begins um, as, an, as a 19-year-old who was sent on mission. Um, I was compelled to go by someone in university who was more persuasive than I was that I should go on mission at the end of my first year. And I ended up in Amsterdam with YWAM, and I experienced what I can only call, what I would describe now as a missional community, a group of believers on mission, growing as disciples together. And that really helped to form my spiritual DNA around discipleship, around mission, and around community. And the last 45 years have been my longing and my dream to see a church come into being that in some way reflects the church that Jesus died for and is coming back for. And if I can make a contribution to that, that's what I long to do. So the question is, how did Jesus make disciples and raise leaders? That's the question I want to address. And I want to give you just a few very, very simple tools and we'll have some time for Q&A in a moment. First, the first question is, what was Jesus' framework? What was Jesus' framework in making disciples? He had three <coughs> dimensions of operation, up, in, and out. Upwards towards God, helping people grow in intimacy and intentionality in relationship with the Lord, in towards each other, building friendship and community as extended family, and out towards the world in mission and service where we live, work, and play. That simple framework, and the triangle is visual so we can remember it, uh, is, a, is a framework you can put on any discipleship context, whether it's uh, a new Christian, whether it's um, a home group or a cell group, whether it's a whole church, whether it's a leadership team. If we're not growing in all three dimensions, then we're not growing in discipleship in the way that Jesus made disciples. If you look through the Gospels, you'll see again and again, this is what he was doing, these three dimensions all the time. 
Luke 6 is a good example. He goes up the mountain to pray. And, you know, the key point about prayer that we've heard this morning before choosing leaders. He went up the mountain to pray, modeling this relationship with God, this intimacy with the Father. He comes down the mountain and he gathers his disciples and he chooses the 12. Mark's Gospel says those he wanted to be with him. Not just the people who were the most skilled, not just the people who had the best heritage or family background or education, but those he want, he knew these were people he could work with. And it's so important as we are gathering people around ourselves, making disciples, raising leaders, these are people we feel like God is drawing to us. And we'll all be different in that, so different people will draw and gather different people. He gathers them to himself, he spends time with them, he invests time with his disciples, and then they go out on mission together. You see all of that in Luke 6. They come, he comes down the mountain, gathers disciples, chooses the 12, and then they go out and start healing the sick and bringing the message of the kingdom of God. So a simple framework that allows us to think about raising disciples as a way of raising leaders. That You can, you can put that little triangle as a sort of fractal over any group or individual person that you are working with. Are they growing in all three dimensions? Mm -hmm. We want three dimensional disciples, Amen. not two dimensional, Absolutely. not one dimension. Yeah. Okay, second thing. What was Jesus' process? What was Jesus' process? We use a very, another very simple tool. When I say we, I'm talking about Kairos Connections. We work with leaders and churches all around the country. We call it the Leadership Square or the Discipleship Square. You can call it either. And uh, you see Jesus doing this all the time. And uh, he takes people round the square, basically. He says, we start here, we move here, onto here, and we finish here. And so D1, discipleship one, or L1, leadership one, is all around that first phase of gathering people to yourself, where you're saying, that, you know, I know you don't know anything. You may think you know everything, but I know you know nothing, okay? I remember Bill Wilson coming to our, one of our conferences one year at Frontline. And he says, if you're under 30, you know nothing. <laughs> he offended half the room in one go. Um, but the older you get, the more you realize, actually, when I was less than 30, I did know nothing. It's true. But the key thing about this stage is I do, you watch. Okay, so I'm leading by example on the great point that David made. It's about association. It's about alongsideness. It's about... Jesus saying, just come and be with me. He says, come and follow me. Watch what I do. Let me show you how to heal the sick. Let me show you how to preach the gospel. Let me show you how to have compassion. Let me show you how to raise the dead. It's let me do it and you watch. Mark 1, Jesus said, come follow me. And at once they left their nets. Jesus is directive. Leadership in this stage of discipleship and leadership training is a directive style of leadership. He's not giving them the option to say, okay, let's take a vote, what should we do today? He says, no, follow me, this is what we're doing. If you think about parents, I think about this as the, the excited pre-birth stage of parenthood. You know, when everything is wonderful, we're gonna have this baby, it's amazing, I've read all the books, and you know, we're gonna be the most, best parents on earth. That it's an excited phase, you have no idea what's about to hit you. Okay, anyone been a parent? Okay, remember that phase where it was all, it was all wonderful before the first child arrived? And then the first child, oh God, can I send him back? No, it's, <laughs> it's not quite so easy as I thought. So the leader leads by direction and by example. We sometimes call this stage for the disciple, it's unconscious incompetence unconscious, in other words, I don't know what I don't know as a disciple. So Jesus is very patient with his disciples. He takes them along with him. They think, yes, we found the Messiah, and they follow him, and they watch him, and they learn from him. There's lots of energy and lots of excitement. D2, um, if the first stage the disciples are incredibly optimistic, D2, they are incredibly pessimistic because Jesus has started to delegate. It's the I do, you help. Okay. And this is where they suddenly discover, I know nothing. Okay. Remember them panicking in the storm, Matthew 8? Oh, help, Lord, we're going to drown. Remember the, the demons they couldn't drive out? Why couldn't we drive him out, Lord? Matthew 17. 
And at this stage, Jesus is not just giving direction, he's drawing them alongside, he's encouraging them, he's nurturing them. And if we're making disciples, every disciple goes through, D, we call it D2. It's a kind of just a catchphrase that we use all the time in our leadership circles. Oh yeah, they're just going through D2. You know? They're going through that stage where they're discovering what they don't know. And this is where we need to be very encouraging, very nurturing in our style of leadership with them. At the, uh, in, the, in the parenting analogy, the baby is born and they suddenly realize, I think I might need some help here. It's not as easy as I thought. How do I feed this thing? How do I get them to sleep? How do I avoid killing them? You know, it's got all sorts of basic questions. And it's what we call conscious incompetence, where a disciple does not know what, a do, finally does know what they don't know. Conscious, they are conscious of their incompetence. One of, the, one of the things at this stage is the disciple often wants to go back to D1 because they think D2 is far too hard. They want to give up. They think this is terrible. Why did I sign up for this? And they say, let me go and find another leader to follow. Or let me go and find another project to join. Or let me go and find another way of being a disciple. This is far too hard. Let me just go and go in one of those big churches where I can sit at the back and just listen to the sermon and go away and do what I want. Yeah. D2 has become too difficult. But the wise leader, disciple maker, nurtures their disciples through D2 into D3. Sorry. D3 is where you do and I help. So I'm now passing the bulk of responsibility on to you as someone who is actually going to start to take responsibility. I often say there are, there are two things that a leader takes. They take initiative and they take responsibility. And there are two things that a leader gives. They give permission and they give support. Because there's another whole generation of leaders rising behind them that they need to nurture. So in D3, the disciple starts to go from pessimist to optimistic. The leader starts to take his hands off a little bit and starts to allow them to take more and more initiative by themselves. It's the I, you do, I help stage. Think of the disciples distributing the loaves and fishes. Imagine the miracle of saying, ah, look what's happening, Jesus is multiplying in my hands. Amazing. They're starting to discover the power of faith and the power of obedience walking in Jesus' ways. They're growing in confidence. They come back from the mission in Luke 10. Even the demons are subject to us in your name, Lord. And he said, yeah, no, that's great. But just don't forget, it's more important, your names are written in the book of life. So just a little bit of adjustment, a little bit of, you know, just realigning with the most important things, but you're doing really well, by the way. You're doing just great. The leader coaches to release their full potential. It's the stage of conscious competence, where the mum and dad think, yeah, I think we're getting the hang of this. We could even have another child, couldn't we? And as the child goes to school, the, the child themselves are starting to become more and more independent, and uh, the parents are looking, feeling more and more confident. And D4, the final stage, where the disciple is now mature, they're released into their areas of responsibility, it's you do and I watch. And Jesus finally passes on the mantle to his disciples. He says, actually, you've got it so well, you're still going to make mistakes, but right now I'm going back to the Father. I'm going to send you the Spirit because you're still going to need some help, but you go and make disciples of all nations. And the, uh, in the parenting analogy, the child leaves home fully independent, but mum and dad are still around if they're needed. The, leadership, the leader delegates responsibility and authority, but is still available. And this is the stage we call unconscious competence. It's where you've, like you've learned to ride a bike, you're no longer thinking about balancing or steering, you just do it because you can do it. And that simple framework, that discipleship or leadership square, we find a really helpful way of calibrating where I'm up to in the process of raising disciples. And as a, as a leader, you know, my life always has to be on display, I'm always leading by Example. So I'm allowing people to be alongside me. They're seeing me with all of my vulnerability. Uh, we talk about my own mistakes. They'll see me get things wrong at times, and I'll have to apologize to them as well. But they're seeing me. They're following me. As I imitate Christ, they are imitating me. And one of the questions I love to ask people in this process is, do you have a life worth imitating? That's a horrible question, I know. It keeps us awake at night time. But if we haven't got a life worth imitating, we probably aren't going to raise leaders very well. Mm.
because they need to be close to us. We need to draw them alongside. And the final thing I want to say is this, is what was Jesus' context? Because we often think about making disciples or raising leaders. We think about mentoring and coaching, which is a really important and powerful tool. Jesus' context was rarely, if ever, one-to-one. -one. He almost never raised his disciples and raised those disciples as leaders with one-to-one -one mentoring. Occasionally he had one-to-one -one conversations, but it was nearly always as a group. And one of the things that we do is we've cultivated a way of coaching and raising disciples and leaders in a group context. We call it a huddle. You can think about penguins huddling on the ice floe. You think about American footballers huddling at the break times for strategy and encouragement and you know a little pep talk before they go out and score some more points on the pitch. But that coaching process is a way of creating a discipleship and leader raising environment which is which is has the potential for multiplication. You see coming back to the why of raising leaders if we want to see Jesus come back the task completed every nation reached with the gospel because every person has played their part in the Great Commission then we have to find a way of multiplying disciples leaders communities and churches and we need to raise leaders fast enough to be able to do that and if we're only ever going to be one-on-one -on -one, it will be very powerful and effective but it will never be enough to get the job done I love the fact that Billy Graham, after many years in ministry, with all of his stadiums full of people, was asked, what would you do if you were starting all over again? And he said, I would choose 12 men, 12 people. I would pour my life into them over many years and leave them to do the same with others. That's the power of multiplication. That's what Jesus did. He poured his life into 12. He raised up 120, and he left them to get on with the job. It's incredible that you and I are sitting here today because those initial 12 were obedient and what they had multiplied. And as we look at the ways of Jesus, I want us to think about how we can coach groups of people. And my final tool that I want to leave you with is this. It's what we call the two discipleship questions. So whether it's in a conversation over the dinner table, whether it's in a a one-on-one -on -one situation, whether it's in a coaching group context, whether it's in a small group, or even on a Sunday morning when we're preaching, I'd love to ask these two questions. Okay, you've heard my preach today. What's God saying to you? What are you going to do about it? It's all about training people to hear the voice of God and live in obedience. Again, it's Luke 6. It's the wise and foolish man who heard what God was saying and put it into practice. And we've just found multiple, multiple ways of bringing people back to those two discipleship questions. It's the fastest means of growing disciples and leaders that I know of. Teaching people to recognize the voice of God because he's speaking all the time through scripture, through events, through people. And then offering them a place of accountability so that they do what they believe God is telling them to do. And so we talk about the two abilities that we think disciples and leaders need to have. Two fundamental abilities that require no education whatsoever. Availability and accountability. And with those two things in mind, asking those two questions, we can raise multiples of disciples and leaders, whether it's for church or small group or planting or Christian leadership in business or organizations or ministries. Those two questions are absolute gold dust. If you take nothing away from today, you can read the book, you can find out lots of ways of getting to those two questions, but those two questions are life changers for disciple making and leader raising. Just to say, when we're doing these huddles, these group coaching calls, I probably huddle about 25 senior leaders around the country in groups online. We do it using an you know, on online platform with four, five, six, seven, eight on screen at the same time. It's always to try and get to those two discipleship questions and then we'll rotate through these three areas in the coaching group. Character, which we've heard a lot about this morning, absolutely fundamental. So how is God challenging 
me in the area of character? Competency, what are the skills I need to grow as a disciple and as a leader? And then context, how does all this apply to the situation you're in where you're taking initiative and responsibility? And as we, we cycle through those three topics over uh, months and sometimes years, you know, maybe a couple of, couple of weeks on character, a few weeks on competency, a few weeks on, on context in these groups, people are growing as disciples and leaders and then mul multiplying that into others at the same time. So, we have a few minutes for Q&A. Anybody want to ask something, comment on something? Really happy to take any questions. And if there's any really difficult, really difficult questions, then the two Davids will answer your questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is very quick, sorry. You said leaders take responsibility and there was a second. Initiative. Initiative. Initiative and responsibility. It's a give and take. It's, I call it the give and take of leadership. They take initiative and responsibility. They give permission. In other words, permission for others to have a go, permission and support. Yeah, because a leader always thinks about raising other leaders. Yeah. You know, one of the, the, the most important jobs any church leader can do, I, I believe it has to be their number one priority, mm -hmm. is to raise other leaders. Right. Before, the, even before they operate in ministry. Yeah. You know, it's the whole Ephesians four thing. You know, we're here to equip the saints for the work of service. Mm -hmm. Before we want to platform our own ministry and our great preaching and our healing ministry or whatever it is our organizational skills we actually want to be raising other leaders because multiplication is the holy grail of leadership it's how we get the job done it's how we get jesus back yeah. i have a question in regards to the the leadership squad that we yeah. spoke about yeah. so we went through the different stages about being unconsciously incompetent so on and so forth mm -hmm. when we get to the stage that we are unconsciously unconsciously competent, mm -hmm. what could the potential dangers be as a leader in a business? What are the potential dangers? Well, there's dangers at every stage. Uh, the potential dangers at that stage is we think we know it all, um, and we stop learning. You know, the, the definition of disciple, the Greek word methetes, means a learner. And uh, I'm not, I, I, I see nowhere in scripture that we ever stop being disciples, so we never stop being learners. And so for me, I, I massively value accountability in my life. So I will voluntarily make myself accountable to others. I've had many, many mentors over the years, and I still do today. I'm always looking to people. One of my mentors is a, a young guy. He's 20 years younger than me, but he knows more than I do. He's seen more than I've seen, and I want to be accountable to him. And, I, and I'm, I'm part of one of his coaching groups because I want to keep learning. But everywhere I go, I'm thinking I was giving a, a talk somewhere. What was it? Somewhere early this week. And somebody challenged me on something I said. I thought, wow. That's a great point, you know. That's absolutely right. I need to take note of that. So it's an attitude first, but there's a, a way of creating accountability second that protects us from what I think is the biggest danger of D4, which is uh, an overconfidence in my wisdom, skill, ability to do the job I'm called to do. And I think there are plenty of other dangers, but that's certainly the one I'd highlight. It's a good question. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Um, could you, you know, in the, the easy speak, the child friendly speak, you spoke about D1 being summarised as I don't know what I don't know, and D2 is I don't know. I know what I know what I don't know. Could you do D3, D4? Okay, yeah, D, D3 is I'm beginning to think I know what I know, and D4 is um, I do what I do without thinking. So if you, riding a bike analogy is another really good analogy for the, the square. So D1 is bikes in the shark box, opening the package on Christmas day. This is gonna be amazing. I'm gonna be the best BMX rider ever. You know? D2 is the first time you take it out and have a go. Okay, ah, my knees are hurting. D3 is I'm riding, but I'm a bit wobbly and I have to think about steering and pedaling and keeping balance at the same time. I can do it, but it's a lot of thought and effort, effort required. D4 is, I'm off. I'm not even thinking about steering, being balanced, or pedaling. It's just natural. Good question. Thank you. Yeah? What about leaders who think they really know everything? Like, say you, as a disciple, trying to ask them a question that you think is okay, and they're telling you, okay, okay, no, it's not like that, it's not like that. This is the way, you know, doing it their own way. Do you think about leaders like that? Leaders who think they know everything, I generally avoid them. 
I'm, I am always attracted and drawn to people who are also learners because I know that they, they probably have more wisdom than anybody else in the room. If someone who's always ready, ready to learn, always ready to, you know, to, be, to change the way they think or the way they do things. Just by the way, I thought that point earlier was, this is another point, but about emotions was just so powerful and so important. I, I sometimes think I'm an incredibly slow learner. It, it wasn't until about 10 years ago that I finally got the hold of the idea that you know most human beings rarely make decisions on the basis of rational thought. Yeah. <laughs> and as a rational, analytical, logical human being, I would tend to think, well, of course I'm doing this because I've worked out what's the best thing to do. You know, I've thought it through, and I've analyzed this, and I've looked at the options, and I've done a plus and a minus, and I've made a decision. Actually, it was nothing to do with any of that. Is what did I feel at the time? How was I feeling? My, my feelings will inform my decision making 90% of the time, rightly or wrongly. And we need to be more aware of those emotions as we were hearing earlier. But uh, yeah, so I, I tend to avoid those leaders. And uh, you know, God has a way of getting their attention eventually, usually because there's a crash and burn moment and they suddenly realize, oh, maybe I didn't know it all, all after all, but that's not my problem, that's, that's God's problem. It's a good question. <laughs> One question we have to stop here. If does your disciple automatically become a leader if you're a, if you're a leader? If I'm a leader, 